Hello friends, we will continue uh, with the PYQs and MCQs. Uh, today I am going to uh, discuss some of the very important PYQs and I will give you a trend. I will show you how the UPSC is asking and what kind of uh, you know continuity they have in certain topics. So having said this, I will start with the first question. So this was a question asked in 2013 uh, prelims. Um, so it says, in the grasslands, trees do not replace the grasses as a part of ecological succession because of. So ecological succession is a process in which the trees will replace the grasses, grasses will replace the mosses, mosses will replace the lichens. So likewise, there is a sequence of uh, uh, trend or the succession which happens wherein as the environment keep on improving mainly the soil as the soil gets better and better some more higher advanced plant will replace the existing plant community and they will establish again they will improve the environment some other plant community which is much more advanced or higher uh, will replace the existing one so it's like a survival of the fittest so this keep on happening until the stage where the soil becomes so fertile that no more improvement in the soil is possible. So after that, it establishes a stage called climax. And usually the succession, the ecological succession starts with the mosses uh, and lichens. They are the ones who existing in a place where no other plant can grow. So these uh, mosses and lichens are uh, called as pioneers. So they are called pioneers. and they are established in a first stage. I will give you an explanation of, uh, you know, I will show you how the uh, things happens here. In ecological succession, see these are the grasses, okay. So grasses come somewhere in between, in middle of the, uh, in middle of the things, okay. So just a second. Okay, yeah, I was here. So it comes in middle of the succession. So it starts with lichens and mosses, and later on it will uh, be replaced by some some small grasses. When the grasses improve the environment, then it will uh, lead to the few more advanced, uh, you know. Uh, small shrubs or the trees, small trees, shade tolerant trees and others. And later on they will be replaced by some bigger trees. This is how the succession goes on. But here we are seeing in, in uh, grasslands, what are the things which do not cause us or which do not let that succession to happen. So you can see here this is how the uh, uh, grasslands looks like. So you have certain you know grasses all covered covering the entire area and some trees scattered here and there. If at all it is a tropical uh, grasslands, but if it is temperate grasslands, then it will be entirely grasses, temperate grasslands like steppes, pampas or prairies or tropical grasslands like you know the one which is here like savanna and others. So here you can usually find some trees scattered but never completely. Uh, you know done by or never completely replaced by trees this keeps on happening so the reason for that is basically water limits and fire so there are three things which limits the soil from getting improved so if the soil get improved definitely the next uh, you know successor will come and replace the existing uh, plant variety or plant community. So if that doesn't has to happen, then there should be some check and that check is water limits and fire. So along with this water limits and fire, even the grazing animals will also eat up. See how water limits, if there is no water, then definitely the organic matter decomposition won't happen. So there won't be improvement in the soil conditions and because the fire burns everything 
so it will not allow the organic matter to be added to the soil so that decomposition happens and grazing animals also eats those grasses and do not allow organic mat mat matter to be added to the soil so these are the three conditions which will not allow the uh, the soil conditions to improve so that the succession won't happen in places where the uh, soil conditions improve a little bit there you can find the growth of trees okay so the answer for this is c water limits and fire so this was a question in 2013 guys so anybody who would have done a pre previous year question analysis they would have studied all these aspects okay then this is this is how it looks like you have grasses you have you know you'll be having fire and less water so look at this question this was a question asked in 2021 prelims the vegetation of savanna consists of grassland with scattered small trees but extensive areas have no trees they are just giving a description of how savanna looks like or temperate grasslands looks like the forest development in such areas is generally kept in check by one or more or a combination of some conditions okay so they are always kept in check by one condition or some more or combination of all these conditions which of the following conditions so they are asking the exact same thing which has been asked in 2013 prelims so it's a kind of repetition in 2021 prelims so they are asking burrowing animals and termites no it's not a factor fire is a factor grazing herbivorous animals okay seasonal rainfall and not soil properties soil, soil properties are the not the factors so no we stressed these are the three factors so and the answer for this basically is two three and four okay so that that is the answer so d is one three and five which is not the answer one and two four and five are not the answers so basically there are two things to learn from here one is certain themes are important which gets repeated irrespective of how many after how many years they get repeated so they keep repeating this is one of the uh, proof of it now let's move on to the next question so i have started this question guys uh, from uh, 31 because i have already discussed the 30 questions in my previous class this is the 31st question so this is the 32nd question the 32nd question is a question from 2013 Okay, prelims 2013 which of the following is our unique characteristic or characteristics of equatorial forest so they are asking about the characteristics of equatorial forest equatorial forests are also known as the uh, the uh, tropical rainforests so or the tropical forests simply tropical forest so those which are present in and around the equator so these are the areas which has very high amount of rainfall and very high amount of very high temperature okay both rainfall and temperature are very very high here okay so they are asking the characteristics first one is presence of tall closely set trees with crowns forming continuous canopy so the crowns will be formed in such a way that the canopy will be continuous okay and they will be closely set trees they have very dense tree uh, population okay. coexistence of large number of species it's not only one species which are present but in these equatorial forests or tropical forests so you have multiple species that's why we call it as three tire system there will be very tall trees there will be trees occupying the middle canopy and also the trees which are in the lower level shrubs and short trees so it has different species growing at different heights so there are different number of species presence of numerous varieties of epiphytes epiphytes are those plants which grows on the other plants okay they'll grow on other trees usually they climb up to the top and they grow on the upper branches of these trees okay so those are epiphytes so the answer for this is d one two and three so you should know the characteristics so people who do pyqs they usually study all the aspects of uh, these equatorial forests because it has been asked in the examination so this is how the equatorial forests look like okay, you can see 
that you have one species which are very top occupying species then you have two tire second tire and some of the third tire species different species are there so they are so densely covered that you know there is a continuous canopy and these are some of the plants which grows on the branches epiphytes okay so this is the this is how the equatorial forests look like now just look at this question from prelims 2021 again the same thing okay it says the leaf litter decomposes faster than any other biome and as a result the soil surface is often almost bare so they are saying that the leaf whatever happens will be decomposed because of good microbial load but whatever the things which has been decomposed will be not in the soil but they will be tied up in the vegetation so the vegetation has all the nutrition because it absorbs there is a huge amount of plant population so it will not allow the nutrition to be present in the soil it will absorb and store it in the canopy so the soil is bare apart from trees vegetation is largely composed of plant forms that reach up to the canopy vicariously by climbing the trees or growing as epiphytes okay so it is talking about those plants which grows are epiphytes okay rooted in the upper branches of the trees so they're just de describing how the epiphytes are grown so just by epiphytes you can you'll come to know that they are talking about the tropical rainforest so the answer for this is this d tropical rainforest it's not coniferous it's not dry deciduous or neither it is mangroves okay so this is the option the tropical rainforest is the right option for this this is the exact question you know anybody who has done a PYQ 2013 would have easily done this 2021 uh, question so that is uh, the next question 34th question next is uh, a question asked in previous year uh, 2013 prelims on the planet earth most of the fresh water exists as ice caps and glaciers out of the remaining fresh water the largest portion is so they are just asking that how what is the largest portion after ice caps so it is found in atmosphere as moisture found in fresh water lakes and rivers exist as groundwater or exist as soil moisture so here you know the first highest water is present in the oceans after oceans it is the uh, ice caps or glaciers and after glaciers it is the ground water which is highest so the option is c so let's try to know a little bit uh, about this okay so you can see this is how the water cycle happens so the water in the rivers oceans will evaporate okay the plants will uh, you know uh, lose the water through transpiration they'll go to the atmosphere they'll get condensed and they'll come back in the form of rain snow hail as a precipitation and both of, some of them will seep into the water and stored as a underground water so this is how the water table goes on so other than this if you look into the um, amount of water around uh, you know on the earth 71 percent of the uh, earth is filled with water and only 29 percent is land okay so in the entire earth only 25 9 percent of the earth is terrestrial or land and remaining 75 percent is aquatic okay so out of this 71 percent you know 90 7.5 or nearly 98 percent is present in oceans okay 98 percent is present in oceans and out of the remaining okay, so say 97 percent okay it's 97.5 say 97 percent so remaining three percent is present outside the oceans so ocean covers 97% the highest 
then 3% outside the oceans. Out of these outside oceans, so ice which is like you know say 69.5% of that. So if you take this percentage and calculate uh, you know here, so 2% is present as ice caps. Or glaciers, okay, and out of the remaining one percent, okay, I'll write it here. So remaining one percent, zero point six eight percent is present as groundwater. Zero point zero zero. 9% is present as inland lakes okay 0.008% is made up of salt water lakes okay these two are lakes okay so let's see if i could see change the color because it's okay. So zero point six eight per cent groundwater. 0.009% is inland water, 0.008% is salt water lakes or salt as inland oceans, 0.001% is the amount of present in water present in atmosphere. Okay, and zero point zero 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 one percent of uh, water is present in rivers. So this is the percentage: ninety-seven percent oceans, two percent ice caps, and remaining one percent zero point six eight percent groundwater, zero point zero nine percent inland lakes. Freshwater lakes, 0.0.008 percent saltwater lakes, 0.001 percent is present in atmosphere, and 0.0001 percent is present in rivers. So this is the statistics. Okay. So if you know this statistics, it's easy for you to answer this question. Okay. So you know that. Most of them are ice caps, remaining it is groundwater. See, this is a question from prelims 2013. Now, answer this question from prelims 2021. Okay. So, with reference to the water on the planet Earth, consider the following statements. You know, the amount of water in the rivers and lakes is more than the amount of groundwater. Just know the statistics. In rivers and lakes, it is 0.0089%. Okay. So, 9% in lakes and 0.0001% in rivers. So, but in uh, groundwater it is 0.68%. So, this cannot be the answer, one is wrong. The amount of water in polar ice caps and glaciers is more than the amount of groundwater. So, obviously, polar ice cap has 2% of the water stored and groundwater at 0.68%. So, the second statement is right. So, the option here 2 is right. Okay, this is a wrong statement. So, if at all you would have done that PYQ of 2013 and uh, you know that would have that was the exact thing you know this question is around few seconds to answer uh, if you know the statistics and if you have done it properly. So, that is the next question ok all right. The next question ok. So, lichens which are capable of initiating the ecological succession even on a bare rock are actually the symbiotic association of 
charging lichens which are a symbiotic association between two organisms uh, you know what are the two organisms with which it is made up of so algae bacteria algae and fungi bacteria and fungi fungi and mosses so the answer for this is algae and fungi so algae and fungi are the two organisms which symbiotically makes lichens so the fungi provides algae with the place to live it becomes the host and it will uh, allow it to live okay so and algae produces food through photosynthesis and it will provide the nutrition for the fungi so both are getting benefited from each other and that is what is lichen so this is the question which has been asked and uh, you know once the doing this question if you see a little bit on the uh, succession and lichens okay you can see that the bare rocks usually are uh, you know there is no nutrition no plants can grow on rocks there is no soil so for the first time certain organisms comes and establish itself okay called lichens and mosses so these are the two organisms which are also called as pioneers so because they start growing on this bare rock they don't require sufficient nutrition or water or anything so they'll just grow on these rocks and they will start degrading or decomposing these rocks you can see lichens and mosses so they will deposit on this and they will break down these rocks and they will start producing or start weathering and slowly these rocks will get converted into the soil okay and once the soil is formed these the rocks they were acted by mosses and this thing they become soil and once soil is formed small grasses grow then some big plants some trees and this is how a succession happens this is a gif showing the entire sequence of succession so initially there will be lichens and mosses called as pioneers then they will be you know replaced by annual weeds as the soil gets formed annual weeds will come and they will start establishing replacing the lichens then perennial weeds and grasses will replace the annual weeds then shrubs will come and they will replace perennial weeds then certain plants like aspen cherry and pine forest they will establish and finally beech and maple see some of the species might still continue here and once the soil gets perfectly weathered and no more improvement is possible so the succession will not go and this stage is called as climax okay and these lichens and lichens are made up of fungi and algae okay that's why they do not need nutrition from the soil they can get nutrition from algae doing the photosynthesis okay so this is what is about the succession okay and uh, once you know this you know what are lichens and you will answer this easily so this question from 2014 now look at the uh, question from 2021 so this is the prelims 2021 in the nature which of the following are most likely to be found surviving on the surface without soil so what survives on the surface without soil so ferns need soil mushrooms need you know soil or other things so at least the you know the roots or the trees on which it grows lichens and mosses are the option there is uh, you know two and three here the c option so this is the right option right so this question was a cake walk if at all had done a pyq all right one more question okay so question number 39 this was a question in 2013 due to improper or indiscriminate disposal of old and used computers or their parts which of the following are released into environment as a e waste so because we are improperly disposing the old computers or electronics so or their parts which of them are released into environment as a e waste so say beryllium cadmium 
chromium, heptachlor, mercury, lead and plutonium. So, they have given a list of things. So, you should know that heptachlor is a pesticide used for killing of insects. Okay. So, they are the heptachlor is a spray which is used for killing insects, pesticides and insecticides and plutonium is a radioactive material. It is a radioactive material. See both of them causes pollution. Pesticide causes water pollution. So, the plutonium causes radioactive pollution, but definitely they are not the part of e-waste. So, if you remove 4 and 7, so you have um, 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6. 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6. This is the answer. So, option B is the answer for this and this is how you answer the question, right. So, if you look into the, uh, you know, components of the e-waste. So, first one is lead, usually used in glass panels and gaskets in computers, monitors, solder in printed circuit boards and other components. So, that is one of the main component. Cadmium is used in SMD chip resistors. They are used in IR detectors usually, uh, you know, the one which police use to analyze the breadth of alcohol uh, drink and drive cases. So, then semiconductor chips, cathode ray tubes, okay. So, they are used in these electronic items. Mercury is used in thermostats, sensors. So, relay switches, medical equipments like thermometers, lamps, mobile phones, batteries, flat planel displays. So, and barium is used in uh, the computer in the front panel. Okay, in the front panel of the computer, you will be using barium. Then you have chromium used as a corrosion protector of untreated and galvanized steel plates. So, in galvanized steels, to protect them from corrosion, so we will be using chromium. So, it is used for decorative and hardener for steel housing, plastics, cabling, computer housings. So, usually you can see that chromium cover is given, you know, for giving shine and to protect them from corroding. Then beryllium is found on motherboards and finger chips, finger clips, copper beryllium alloy to strengthen connectors and tiny plugs. So, all these small, small uh, you know, connectors and plugs will have uh, the beryllium as a component. Then you have toners, you, can, you know that toners have been used in printers, multiple of the printers, used in plastic printer cartridge containing black and color toners. Then phosphor is applied as a coat on interior of CRT face plate. Okay. So, the in the computer, the CRC face plate, you will be using phosphor, phosphorus screen. Usually, they will be using, that is how when the photons emitted excites the phosphorus screen, that is what illuminates, illuminates and display as a, uh, you know, give you the picture. Okay. So, it is used in front panels. So, these are certain, uh, you know, e-wastes which are being used and uh, so, this is the list. So, if you know the list, then you can answer, you know that we studied beryllium, cadmium, chromium, mercury and lead. So, we know that chromium, uh, the heptachlor and plutonium, uh, we would have not studied. So, they are not the part of e-waste. So, other than this, uh, we should also study as a part of e-waste, if you are studying the components of e-waste. So, very important component is the, you know, e-waste management rules 2011. So, e-waste management and handling rules 2011. It is effective from 1st May 2012, contains SIP chapters and three schedules. Okay, it's a, uh, you know, rule which contains six chapters talking about different components of e-waste and six schedules. So, there are some mandatory provisions under this, like, you know, extended producer responsibility. That means the producer of the electronic waste is not only uh, having a responsibility to produce and dispose, 
but he should keep a watch on when the expiry date is going and where it is going, which uh, retailer he is selling and from there where exactly which customer it is going and how they are disposed. So you should uh, you know, have responsibility of even collecting the e-waste and properly disposing them of. So that is the responsibility of the producer which has been extended. Other than production, he should also make sure that it is properly disposed. So that's called as extended producer responsibility. So that's the reason why you can see that many of the uh, electronic things, they have a big uh, box in front of them, which is kept only to collect the e-waste. So anybody can go and uh, put their e-waste there. Okay. Then collection system, how the collection is done. Then registration of dismantlers, anybody who dismantle and reuse the things or dispose the unwanted things, they should be registered and recyclers and reduction of the hazardous substances. So what are the hazardous substances are there that should be reduced and recycled. These are some of the uh, e-waste management rules, mandatory provisions. Okay. So under e-waste, the study of e-waste would be incomplete if you do not read the responsible recycling. Okay. So or R2, right. So there is an organization, there is an institute called Sustainable Electronics Recycling International, SERI. So this has released in 2013, uh, it's, it started in 2008, but right now we are following 2013. Maybe in this year, 2023, it might change to R, you know, R2 2023, but still now we are using the guidelines given in 2013. So it, uh, you know, gives the companies R2 certificate, okay. So R2 is responsible recycling. It's a standard specifically created for the electronic recycling industry. So any company who is the producer of electronics or recycler of electronics, so they'll be given a certificate by this sustainable uh, electronics recycling industry that it is a R2 certified company. So R2 certification is a international and uh, the standards and guidance which has been made available in five languages. So current standard of R2 certification is R2 2013. So whatever the rules which has been given in 2013, if a company follows the rules and make sure that it is not leading to e-waste and uh, it is following all the protocols given under this standards, then it will be given a certificate called as this company is a R2 certified company. So the value of that company will increase the trust on that company about the, uh, you know, from the customers will increase. So they'll start believing that uh, these companies are doing good. So their sales will go up, a lot of benefits. Okay. So that is responsible recycling. So this is what is the amount of background study you have to do whenever you find any kind of Uh, just a second. So this uh, it just went ahead. So this is the background you have to uh, analyze when you do a topic called e-waste. Okay. So now once you do this you'll be able to answer one of the question which was asked in 2019. Okay. In 2019 prelims, there was a question says in India, extended producer responsibility was introduced as a important feature in which of the following. The biomedical waste management and handling rules, 1998. Recycled plastic management, uh, manufacturing and usage rules, 1999. The e-waste management and handling rules 2011 and the food safety and standard regulation. So, you know, obviously, you know that the extended producer responsibility was e-waste management and handling rules 2011. Okay. So, very easy option can be answered in seconds. <clears throat> there was one question in 2021 uh, prelims as well. The R2 code of practices constitutes a tool available for promoting and adoption of Environmentally responsible practice in electronic recycling industry. 
ecological management of wetlands, sustainable practices in agriculture crops, environment impact assessment. So you know that the option is A, which is environmentally responsible practices. You can see the trend, right? 2013, 2019, 2021, like you have to just cover that sphere. If you cover that, like, you know, obviously all these three questions become a cakewalk and this is the answer. Okay, so A is the answer for this. Okay. Now, uh, a question. Okay, just like, you know, that is the trend which I wanted to answer. So, let us discuss some more questions. Which of the following are detrivorous? Okay. So, they have given earthworms, jellyfish, millipedes, seahorse and woodlice. Select the correct answer using the codes below. So, detrivorous, before answering this, you should know what is detrivorous. Detrivorous animals are those animals which feed on detritus. Okay. So, these are the animals which feed on detritus are also known as dead organic matter okay they feed on dead organic matter so basically these are the decomposers they feed on that and they will fulfill their nutritional requirement okay so th what are these uh, you know uh, the animals you know earthquake uh, earthworm earthworms live in the soil and they feed on the dead plant and animal tissues then millipedes also live within the soil and feed on that and wood lice it feed on dead part of food jellyfish and seahorses are the carnivorous animals they feed on other organisms so the answer for this is 1 3 and 5 and it's the c option 1 3 and 5 so rest other options are wrong okay. so now let us see some of the um, Detrivorous animals. Okay, so this is the list of detrivorous animals. You have millipedes. These are millipedes. You can see this is how it looks. Then wood lice. Then dung beetle. Okay, so this is the dung beetle. Sorry, the dung beetle. Okay, then this is cushion star, sea cucumber, fiddler crabs, squat lobsters. So, blowfly larvae, then garden snails, termites, common earthworm, Madagascar hissing cockroach, water springtail and large black slug. These are the uh, diagrams of these things and this is the list. If you remember this list, so you can obviously know uh, what are the different things. You know, these are the animals which are not a uh, detrivorous animal. They live, they eat on living organisms. Like for example, this is a jellyfish consuming other, you know, sea cucumber or any other organism. And this is the um, seahorse which feeds on other small fishes. So that is why they both are not detrivorous or feed on dead organic matter. Consider the following animals, hedgehog, marmot and pangolin. To reduce the chance of being captured by predators, which of the above organisms rolls up and protects or protect her vulnerable parts? So there are some animals, as soon as they found the danger, they will react. Some animals will react by rolling themselves and projecting spiny body. Some animals dug into the soil and hide inside the soil, protecting from the enemy. So out of this they are arising, which animals will roll up? So hedgehog and pangolin so both of them will uh, you know roll up and protect themselves okay and marmot actually when it faces danger it will dig into the uh, ocean and so they dig into the soil and they hide themselves so the answer is one and three see pangolin is one of the most trafficked animal in the world okay so you can see this is pangolin it's also called as scaly animal so the scales of these animals are so much in demand especially in chinese medicine that they are the uh, they are in the top list okay so they are the most trafficked animal in the world 
so because of their scales so when they face any danger they will roll up like this so will the uh, you know uh, animals okay so this is marmot right this is marmot this is how usually whenever this marmot uh, faces any danger it will dig into the soil but the hedgehog and uh, the uh, pangolin will roll up okay they will roll and become like a ball okay so pangolin has been uh, you know in one of the protected regimes and all the international agencies are you know uh, concentrating on stopping the illegal trade of pangolin so that is how it has to be answered then next question recently there was a proposal to translocate some of the lions from their natural habitat in gujarat to which of the following states so uh, following sites so usually if you look into the uh, you know the news so you know that the court supreme court ordered uh, that the lions from gujarat gir forest has been crossing their carrying capacity it has crossed their carrying capacity been overpopulated so they need to they are dying because of competition because of predation so there has been over utilization of resources so they need to be transferred to other sites and one of the best sites which was earlier a site of lion was the kuno palpur wildlife sanctuary in madhya pradesh okay this was the proposal so because these were these are the places these are this kuno palpur in madhya pradesh is one such place where the lions were there before so they uh, they existed before and they uh, used to live and roam around but later on because of poor hunting it got exhausted so b is the right answer but still it is not been uh, you know fulfilled so it has been there so this is a thing because kuno uh, was a wildlife sanctuary which was proposed and kuno is a wildlife sanctuary where this year last year number the cheetahs were reintroduced so that place is very important so you should be very careful about the question from this place okay the term m stripes is sometimes seen in the news in context of so m stripes is an app which is used in tiger enumeration which was happening so tiger enumeration 2018 tiger census so mainly it is for maintenance of uh, tiger reserves okay so mainly it is used for maintenance of tiger reserves so not a indigenous satellite navigation system security of national highways or captive breeding of wildlife fauna so none of this okay so that is how m stripes are used where the tigers are counted you know uh, using this app okay, okay. there is a question in 2020 uh, prelims says with reference to the indian elephants consider the following statements okay the leader of an elephant group is a female okay the maximum gestation period can be 22 months elephant can can normally go to calving till the age of 40 years only among the states in india the highest elephant is in kerala so this was asked because in the same year Uh, an elephant died because it ate the bomb inside a pineapple so it was still a mystery that whether it was been fed by someone to the elephants or it was kept for wild pigs but accidentally it ate those pineapples and it blasted and it was a pregnant uh, elephant it became a national news and that's why like you know they have asked about it so when they asked about m stripes the tiger census were going on that's why they asked when they asked about lion census the lions uh, you know uh, translocation order was discussed and it was you know going on so all these were in news and based on the news the question has been asked so the here the elephant group will always be owned by the oldest elephant that is female okay which will be the leader so the first option is right maximum gestation period is 22 months usually the pregnancy period Uh, for humans it is 9 months for elephants it is 22 months 
okay that's also a right option elephant can normally go to calving till the age of 60 years okay so 60 years and not 40 years so this option is wrong again they have used the word only so it's not 6 40 years among the states in india the highest population is in kerala so kerala is in number third the highest population is in karnataka followed by assam and third kerala is in third place so this is also wrong option the option is one and two only that's a question from 2020 now let us look at this question so there was a question asked in 2015 uh, that with reference to dugong a mammal found in india which of the following statement is correct they have been asking about dugong so a mammal found in india so it is a herbivorous marine animal so it's a marine animal which is herbivorous feeds on the uh, plants in oceans okay found along entire coast of india so uh, that is the second option it is given legal protection under schedule one of wildlife protection act so first is the right answer second it is not found in the entire coast of india it is found only in the eastern coast of india okay so not in the western coast and it is given the legal protection under schedule one of wildlife protection act if you see the schedules of wildlife protection act so you can see that under schedule one this is given so this question tells us that you should definitely remember the animals listed in schedule one at least okay so correct answer is one and three only and this is how this is that this question is asked okay this question came in 2015 and because of which as a part of the you know uh, question analysis and background study so we'll be seeing uh, the wildlife protection act 1972 see why the wildlife protection act 1972 came into force in 1960s there was a rumor that the wildlife condition in india is in a very bad shape so in 1960s late 1960s 1968 69 uh, the prime minister of india was uh, mrs indira gandhi and we all know mrs indira gandhi as a very dynamic lady so was internationally very acclimatized and very you know bold so she did a uh, nuclear test and one of the main important thing which we remember is that she declared emergency so that comes to our mind first but what we don't usually know that indira gandhi was a nature lover she was a very big wildlife enthusiast and very much concerned about environment she's a big environmentalist okay so uh, indira gandhi when this happened that you know people the report started coming you know in newspaper it was getting published that the wildlife condition in india is in very bad shape so uh, the then prime minister mrs indira gandhi appointed a committee under dr karan singh dr karan singh was a known eminent uh, ecologist so under him a committee was formed to study the wildlife status of india wildlife status in india so dr karan singh studied you know with his task force and submitted a report and the report agreed that yes the wildlife condition wildlife condition in india was when this was in a very bad shape many of the species have drastically come down and others so as a measure to this the government of india act enacted wildlife protection act in 1972 and uh, in 1973 tiger project tiger was also started so another measure but yeah wildlife protection act was enacted in parliament in 1972 it has seven chapters 66 sections and six schedules so chapter one talks about general definition chapter two talks about all the authorities to be appointed chapter three is very important which talks about hunting i want you to you know look at these chapters so as a part of your study chapter four talks about the uh, protected area networks okay wildlife sanctuaries national parks conservation reserves and community reserves chapter 5 talks about trade and commerce in chapter 7 there is uh, you know vermins diverse you know just things and it has six schedules and 66 sections so the schedules here is you know this it has schedule 1 in which it has mammals amphibians and birds 
so mammals you can see tiger lion wolf cheetah chinkara dugong elephant back buck kashmiri stag rhino musk deer indian wild buffalo golden langur hula gibbon wild ass fishing cat amphibians and reptiles you have gharial pythons water lizard and green sea turtle and birds you have andaman tail bengal florican great indian bustard and mountain quail okay so other than that you have schedule 2 it has part 1 part 2 subtle animals schedule 3 and 4 certain animals see the punishment level will decrease if you kill an animal or hunt an animal listed in schedule 1 you will attract major penalty and major fines okay major imprisonment but if you kill animals in 3 and 4 so you will attract lesser penalty and lesser punishment okay. so that is that means the schedule 1 is important and guys it's very important that you know they have asked whether dugong is in schedule 1 or not Dugong is in Schedule 1, here it is, and uh, Schedule 5 contains the vermins, that means the animals listed in Schedule 5, even if you kill them, you are not attracting any penalty, you can kill them. So that is the reason why some of the uh, animals from 3 and 4 or 2 will be shifted to Schedule 5 in specific geographical regions in for specific time, so that if at all they are causing menace to human property or crops they can be killed schedule 6 contains certain plants which are uh, you know which cannot be grown without license you know for you cannot sell possess uh, you know grow or transport or even uh, collect destroy do anything and even for growing you have to obtain the permission from or license from CWL3 so those are those plants without license you cannot cultivate them so this is the thing right now, as you know, Schedule 1, they have asked about Dugong. If you look back to the question, even think that you don't know anything about this animal. So, if you know that it is given legal protection under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife of Act of 1972, if you know 3 is right option, straight away A and B will be eliminated. You are left with 1 and 3 and 3 only. So, and if you know that, like, you know, it's a herbivorous animal, you can easily come to the conclusion. Okay. So that was in 2015 and this is the background, uh, you know, thing which we did. Then 2017, so prelims in 2017, according to the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, which of the following animals cannot be hunted by any persons except under some provisions given by law. So they had given that, what are the animals which cannot be hunted by any animal except for some provisions. It says that the animals listed in Schedule 1, they can be hunted if at all. The Chief Wildlife Warden gives permission. Chapter 3 of this Act talks about it. So, if at all the animal is in Schedule 1 and if it is dangerous to human beings, if it is deceased, if it is disabled and beyond recovery and it, it cannot be captured or relocated, then the CWW can give permission for hunting the animals even if it is in Schedule 1. So, but it has to fulfill these reasons. Okay. So, that is what is, uh, you know, Chapter 3 talks about if it is dangerous to human beings can do that but without permission you cannot kill certain animals which are listed in schedule 1 again ghadial indian wild ass and wild buffalo so if you look at this there is ghadial you have uh, indian wild buffalo okay so then you have uh, indian wild ass okay wild ass is there so you know that if you mug up that list Obviously, you would have answered the next question 2017. This would have been again a cakewalk. The answer is 1, 2 and 3, all the 3. Again, 2017. So, this is the second question in the same year. 2017, there were 2 questions from Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So, in India, if the species of tortoise is declared protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act, what does it imply? So, if at all it is under Wildlife Protection Act 1, so what does it imply? It enjoys same level of protection as the tiger, no longer exists in the wild, endemic to a particular region, both B and C. So, these are not. First option itself, got to know, it enjoys the same level of protection as tiger because even tiger is listed in Schedule 1. So, simple. Then, another a question 
if a particular plant species is placed under schedule 6 of the wildlife protection act 1972 what is the implication so you know that schedule 6 contains the plants and if uh, you know plant is placed under schedule 6 what does it mean a license is required to cultivate that plant such plant cannot be cultivated under any circumstances genetically modified crop invasive and harmful to the ecosystem so the answer is you need a license from the chief wildlife warden to do that this was a question in 2019 so no guys if you analyze the previous year questions like this and if you know the overall view of that there are multiple times this has happened in most of the subjects so this is the questions which i wanted to discuss today and uh, so this is all uh, i'm offering for this lecture so thank you so much i'll be coming up with more questions so most uh, you know pyqs and mcqs most probable questions and uh, so we'll meet soon thank you so much have a nice day